Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Dean Sanjeev Kagram of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. We want to welcome all of you uh, for this fantastic Globinar, uh, Thunderbird Global Dialogues on Post-Pandemic Reflections, the Rise of the New Normal, with a major focus on uh, the dynamics and evolving complexities and uh, responses in Indonesia, but around the world as well. Uh, we're going to give everybody a minute to join us. What I'd like to ask is if everyone could introduce themselves in the chat function. Please give us your name, your location. If you're a Thunderbird or ASU alum, please let us know what year, uh, your organization uh, title if you want. We'd love to know who we have uh, in the audience. Uh, we see that we have a fantastic group joining us. And as you know, we have a, a terrific panel. So let's give everyone a minute or two to join and then we'll get started. Again, welcome. Most importantly, we hope that you're all healthy and safe uh, with your loved ones, wherever you, you may be. Again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We see that we have people from all over the world joining us, Thunderbird alums, ASU alums, uh, staff, faculty, students, partners. It's wonderful to see all of you. Please do introduce yourself, as many of you are doing in the chat function. Uh, this is Dean Sanjeev Kagram. We're going to get started just very shortly with our wonderful global dialogue on post-pandemic reflections, the rise of the new normal. Welcome again. Okay, it's great to see everyone uh, introducing themselves in the chat function. Let's get started. Uh, let me introduce myself again. I'm uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kagram, the Director General and Dean of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Uh, I wanna welcome all of you. It's been just about a little over two years that I had the honor and privilege of uh, taking the helm of this incredible institution, uh, this beloved institution that is Thunderbird and to become a member of this wonderful Thunderbird global family. Uh, for all of our alums and our partners, our students, our faculty, our staff around the world, and particularly our alums though, uh, for those of you who are just getting to reconnect with the school, I want you to know that you can again be proud and confident in your beloved institution. Uh, we have uh, returned to the Vanguard status that you were so proudly part of when you were with us probably in Glendale uh, years or many years ago. We have our number one ranking back. We have transformed our curriculum, 
bringing back the very best of the past while really leaning into the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we have established partners and centers, uh, partnerships and centers all over the world, including in Jakarta, thanks to the incredible support of our Jakarta and Indonesia alums like uh, Hilmi and uh, Jimmy Mazarin and many others. Uh, we have um, uh, brought in fantastic new faculty. You'll get a chance to uh, listen to one of them and engage with him today. And so for the, and, and perhaps in some sense, most importantly, uh, alumni are proud and confident again, are unified. And for the first time in perhaps over 20 years, we are completely in the back uh, black uh, and all of our numbers are rising. Our student uh, numbers, our executive education, uh, everything we're doing is moving in the right dire direction. And even since the pandemic and the headwinds, the challenges, the unknown unknowns that the pandemic has uh, introduced. So, uh, uh, and since the pandemic, we have launched these Globinars, these global dialogues to do a, a third very important thing for us, which is to reinsert and reassert re re uh, 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 Thunderbird's uh, vanguard thought leadership around changing global dynamics. As you all know, our vision is a world of sustainable and equitable prosperity. Uh, our mission is to empower, train, influence global leadership and global leaders around this fourth industrial revolution with the rise of uh, the 12 to um, massive technologies that are disrupting everything that we do from AI to the internet of things, distributed ledger, uh, the quantum computing and many others. We know since the pandemic has happened, the primary focus for us as a school and as a community uh, and the world has been everyone's healthy health, safety, and well-being. That's what we've been focused for our students, our staff, our faculty, our partners across ASU, our community members, our alumni. We know that alumni around the world have really been leaders in not only taking care of themselves and their families, but their companies, their organizations, their communities, and their societies uh, acting in true T-Bird fashion. Our pledge, our oath of honor remains true uh, to this day and for the next 75 years that we respect the rights and dignity of all people. We oppose all forms of corruption and exploitation and we advance sustainable and equitable prosperity worldwide. So I couldn't be prouder of where we are as an institution. We have a fantastic leadership team that's done incredible work. Uh, we have a brand new global headquarters that's halfway done. That's gonna truly be a spectacular and one of a kind global head headquarters, the most technologically advanced global headquarters of, only, of any global leadership management business school in the world. And we continue to expand our regional centers of excellence around the world, not in, including of course Jakarta, but also Tokyo and Nairobi, Dubai, um, uh, Geneva, uh, Los Angeles, DC, soon when we can again uh, safely in Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Mumbai, uh, Istanbul to grow to 25 regional centers around the world. So despite the incredible challenges, and we see these all over the world, uh, where people are struggling and have been affected dramatically by this um, great challenge that we face, we know that it's a time for Thunderbird uh, as an institution, as our alumni, our global community, to take leadership again, as we did when we were founded 75 years ago on the ashes of World War II. And so we are looking forward to the next 75 years of Thunderbird. Next year will be our 75th anniversary. Uh, in October of next year, we'll be uh, uh, having our grand opening of our new global headquarters. Uh, we hope and pray, inshallah, that everyone can join us in, in Phoenix for that great global, uh, grand opening, which will be also our next global reunion. Uh, and we will celebrate the next 75 incredible years of our historic institution. Uh, and shaping the world and bringing it together. Uh, in many ways, our countries around the world, the world itself, the planet is on fire. Six, seven, eight months ago, we were paying most attention to the, the fires that ravaged Australia and, and so many other things. And those underlying challenges remain as we contend uh, with this COVID-19 pandemic as well. So again, be proud and confident in this great institution that is Thunderbird know that you are part of a, a wonderful Thunderbird Global family. Please join and connect on T-Bird Connect, our new uh, platform that has succeeded the My 
my my TB my Thunderbird platform. And without further ado, let's get to today's uh, a wonderful global dialogue. Uh, this is our uh, agenda for today. Um, I'll uh, introduce the presenters, and then we'll have uh, a wonderful um, uh, 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 presentation by one of our distinguished new professors. Uh, we'll have some questions and answers and reflections. Um, please continue to introduce yourselves. Uh, and um, if you want to uh, open up the chat window to make some reflections, of course, uh, we'll be muting all microphones, um, but uh, you'll, you'll get a chance to really uh, have a wonderful experience um, uh, with us. Please know that there, these are one of probably now 50, over 50, or maybe even a greater number of global dialogues we've had since the start of the pandemic. And our uh, commitment is to continue uh, to do this for our community and for the world more generally. If there are suggestions or ideas of additional ones uh, and uh, on different themes, please let us know. So if I could get the next slide, please. So I want to introduce my wonderful colleague, Professor Mark Esposito, who has joined us just over a little bit over a year ago now, right, Mark? It seems like yesterday. Uh, it was a world-renowned scholar uh, uh, in, in global business uh, and competitiveness, uh, co-founder and chief learning officer of, of an amazing private sector company named Nexus Frontier Tech on AI and, and the global economy. In addition to what you see, perhaps if you have the screen, he, you know, has a distinguished record, has taught at Harvard and many other places, uh, written fantastic reports, white papers for the World Economic Forum. Uh, most recently published, co-published with uh, distinguished co-authors, The AI Republic, which went to number one uh, in the um, uh, Amazon bestseller uh, list virtually overnight. Uh, and if you have had a chance to listen to Mark or engage with him, certainly our students uh, have been so pleased and honored to have him join our faculty. So we're really delighted. Uh, Mark is, uh, speaks seven languages, uh, is uh, Canadian French and has lived all over the world, is a true T-bird in every way. And most importantly, a wonderful human being. So Mark, without further ado, Mark's gonna give us about 10 to 15 minutes of a overview presentation on what's happening in terms of the new normal or the new abnormal or the new non-normal, whatever we might be in right now uh, from his perspective. And then we'll have our wonderful colleagues from Indonesia uh, join us. So I'll have Mark go first and then I'll introduce uh, our wonderful alums from Indonesia who will reflect on their own experience and what's happening there. So Mark, without further ado, over to you. Sanjeev, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to uh, be part of this because we are really trying to engage and incentivize the spirits and make sure people feel um, supported as we navigate these interesting times. Um, this is a work that um, I have presented for Thunderbird in a number of different settings and occasions. Um, we want this to be an opportunity for conversation. So I'm happy that this time is our Indonesian crowd, the, uh, the primary recipient of this. I happened to be in Indonesia last summer. I was uh, in uh, Bali for an AI summit and I just can never forget the hospitality of that country. And I know it's just a matter of time until I will be in the Jakarta's hub uh, because I can't wait to be back in that beautiful country. So this is something important uh, for me to say because I've been touched by the warm hearted that Indonesians have. And of course the food, if I may say. Um, now, I think the, we, we can try to understand really briefly from a perspective of a few months into this uh, uh, pandemic, what has happened. I mean, we can try to uh, say that on a global level, uh, two concurrent crises have really happened. The first one is a crisis that is uh, related to the lockdown. So we have what we call a real economic crisis before our normal way of dealing with uh, um, any form of exchange economy was put on hold. And consequently, this has also a sparkle, um, an unfortunate economic crisis or financial crisis. And so I'm, I'm, this is obvious for all of us, but what is actually not obvious is that these two kinds of crises happen simultaneously. We really have been struggling a lot with the concurrence of a real economy freeze and uh, a financial crisis uh, that has somehow impacted significantly the capital formation. It's an important part of how uh, countries uh, in general, they are able to uh, thrive. If we go to the next slide, 
Um, we can see that from this interesting uh, chart that the Boston Consulting Group has, pr has produced, we have seen industries that are, uh, they have really been in shambles, struggling a lot with their recovery and industry that has suffered because they were directly impacted by an entirely different way of dealing with our reality. And other industries that somehow have seen a significant boost of their productivity. So clearly the pandemic for some has been a shock for others have been almost like a trampoline for economic opportunity they've never seen before. And we have to consider this, uh, this tension between winners and losers because it very likely will define uh, the conversation on the new normal. Um, this is one kind of uh, representation from Boston Consulting Group. With my co-authors, if we go to the next slide, we have equally tried to represent the same, a little bit probably uh, simpler to understand. We look at different type of impacts and industries and the colors of the bubbles represent whether they have been severely heat or not. Um, you notice that clearly uh, there are a number of different industries that will never be the same after this, mainly because their uh, financial uh, structure has been heavily compromised and it suffered. And there are other industries that have simply taken an accelerant. Um, there's a clear reference to the fact that the fourth, the, the fourth industrial revolution got really accelerated by the pandemic. And this is one of the first conversations I'd like to bring forward as we try to get into the mood of the dialogue and the webinar um, discussion that we're going to have with uh, the esteemed colleagues. Um, we really are seeing the rise of the tenants on the fourth industrial revolution. And this was somehow made possible by the fact that the pandemic became like an eco chamber that really accelerated us almost like six to seven years from where we used to be the pre-pandemic. One important thing to consider, we always talk about new normal, but I think it's fair that we'll discuss today multiple new normals, because one of the things clearly evident in our eyes is that the increasing amount of asymmetries in industries, region, and countries will not necessarily uh, lead to the creation of one new normal. The question will be, how will we navigate multiple new normals, which is one of the challenges that I think we have to face as society. If we go to the next one, um, this is how we, with my co-authors, uh, Terence C. and Olaf Growth, uh, within a small think tank exercise that we had done, the think tank is called Cambrian Futures, uh, we have tried to uh, uh, come up with the framework that I've been presenting throughout the entire pandemic. And uh, the framework is really about uh, understanding uh, the forces that really shape the, the new normal, so to say, the logic that is emerging from this, the type of phenomena that have really impacted the rise of new business models, the impact that it has on existing value chains and how can we possibly experiment. So within five steps, the flip it framework really tried to tell us when we're trying to understand a major shock or systemic failures like the one we have currently going through, first of all, what is happening? We'll be in the conversation of the forces. What are the logic emerging from this? because every different transformation is bringing a set of logic to the table. What are the new phenomena and patterns that are emerging from this? Because we want to understand in which way an entirely different way of thinking about value creation has been uh, uh, somehow supported. Then we want to understand how this entirely shift has generated uh, impact in our existing value chains. And finally, we want to understand how do we experiment? This is a very different approach from how we have historically uh, conducted research and development, where we used to spend a significant amount of time in testing and vetting the idea before bringing it over to the market. Today, the market has moved at a much faster pace. The demand shift at a faster pace than how the capacity is able to uh, match. Therefore, those companies that are capable of playing catch are those companies that have rapidly adapted. We can say they're companies that gain resilience. If we go to the next one. This is only a selection of possible forces that have been impacting most of countries on Earth. Um, I'm sure that in Indonesia, uh, this is equally, um, is equally applicable to you as it was applicable to Europe, to North America, to Latin America. So again, it's a way to understand how those forces are shaping an entirely different sense of reality. If we go to the next one. Next slide, uh, Sylvia, please. Uh, we see that these forces are really led to, uh, no, once, one before, sorry. One slide before. Thank you, that's it. 
So we see how the uh, um, these forces have really created a number of different new normals within the business community. I'm going to share with you eight ideas that maybe can lead to a conversation and see how much of this have really penetrated the Indonesian context. But number one, after tremors, increased amount of volatility around the world, very difficult to use traditional economic model to forecast, is really the end of the 20th century uh, economic modeling concept that help us so, so much for the creation of prosperity. And we're now dealing in much more non-linear, multiple events that require different kind of uh, techniques and also mindset. We have seen a number two unavoidable rolls up. We have seen significant uh, changes in how uh, organizations were operating, not only in terms of their uh, physical operation, but also in terms of their financial composition. Many merger and acquisition have, have really happened. Uh, larger companies, more financially solid, have acquired smaller ones. We also see significant um, number of players in the market disappearing. And that's because, of course, their, their, their financial management was not taking into account events of the magnitude like the one we have, or they were running on really short time span in terms of their accounting. We have, as, as a matter of fact, and this is particularly important for Indonesia, as Indonesia is a supply side country in many sides, many ways, we have seen a rise of decentralized supply chains, which changes the original setup or the configuration of a global supply chain. It doesn't mean that we will not have a global supply chain, but it means that the degree of dependency from a global network is going to be reduced because governments have understood that some part of production must be internalized or at least sourced locally. We'll see the rise of what we call near shoring at a much faster pace and what seems to be an horizontal integration of value, which happened in the 80s and 90s as a way to really uh, sparkle the initiation and the beginning of the emerging economies model, uh, might see some contraction in favor of insourcing. So it's likely to imagine that there will be a decrease in demand from international trade uh, because governments are trying to determine some production internally. So point number three is one of the most important ones to discuss within the context of Indonesia. Hybridized work, number four, we have seen the rise of uh, legitimacy of the hybrid model. The fact that we're currently uh, doing a virtual um, reality, a virtual connection through, uh, um, through Zoom, it shows you that we have uh, created an equivalence between the physical and the digital. We still prefer the, the physical, but there will be many instances in the future where we'll justify for cost or for logistic or for any form of travel restrictions, uh, will justify the need to go virtual because it will simply be easier. Um, we'll see in no number five, the rise of uh, real-time data, which is really uh, nested within the concept of artificial intelligence because things like content tracing and uh, uh, at the right time, real-time uh, prevention on public health surveillance has really shifted the sensitivity to information that needs to be produced now. And that kind of sophistication comes with artificial intelligence. In the more physical side of the assets, in number six, we have seen a jump in automation. So more and more uh, organizations trying to uh, uh, shift to automated services, automated production, and some form of robotics, mainly because uh, we have to uh, find some form of hedging in case of uh, follow-up uh, waves of lockdown. Therefore, we have almost accelerated by several years the uh, degree of robotization of many industries. Um, platforms like Amazon, point number seven, have equally grown a lot. Um, and not only Amazon, but a number of different companies that have really understood that by digital uh, transforming their value chain, they were able to uh, meet needs given the uh, new uh, demands that were rising from the pandemic. And finally, uh, we now have an interesting dichotomy between local and virtual coexisting at the same time. We can go to the next slide. One more, Sylvia, please. I'm trying to save on time. This is an example of uh, what could happen in any organization. This is an example of a fashion company that tried to reflect on what would pandemic really do. It's just an excuse for you to see how the analysis on the forces and the new logic uh, need to inspire a direct assessment of the impacts within the value chain. This is the only way we have to really understand in which way our way of doing business is going to be impacted by the transformation that we have seen. 
And this is only exemplifying what happened in more strategic terms, the connection in what we call a Thunderbird. We, we do believe in macro, miso, and micro. So three dimension of economic, uh, economic analysis. So if we understand the macro, we then go into the MISO, which is really the relationship between new business model and the impact in the organization. And then we go into the experimentation on the ground. So we try to bring in micro. We start thinking that any form of new normal will not need to be determined by a, a relationship between a middle space where we understand the impact and an execution space where we can actually experiment and try. So to give you a final so like, thoughts on this, we go to the next slide. Um, these are some examples of new business models that have emerged throughout the pandemic. Many of these are mainly um, models that were maybe in pilots or they were in, in pivoting mode prior to COVID-19 and throughout the uh, pandemic, we have seen I mean, entirely different form of doing business. And many of these are there to stay. They have really shifted our understanding where the market really is. And there's no need for me to go in any of the particular changes. So clearly uh, the, a proof that even in times of uh, um, challenges, we can try to experiment in times of challenges, we can try to search. And this is really one of the reflection I would like to uh, uh, bring to you. We've been talking now for 13 minutes. I think it's a great time for me to provide with the push that we can go into the discussion. Uh, the definitely uh, provided us with an opportunity for a reflection on how weak and ill-conceived some of our institutional framework used to be before is inevitable that new normals, and I'm talking intentionally in plural form, will rise ahead of us, but there is no uh, self-fulfilling prophecy that we will not be able to navigate and thrive. That's the kind of mindset we want to actually foster in our institution, that we can turn adversity into opportunities if we have the right uh, condition for us to shape the mindset. And that's what I'd like to talk with you tonight, tonight as we go deeper into the Indonesian context. Sanjeev, back to you. Thank you so much, Mark. A wonderful tour de force. And uh, I know many of us are seeing many implications, certainly myself, on, with respect to that higher education or education uh, uh, function right there in the triage. Let me now introduce our wonderful panelists, Indonesian alums. And I'm sorry that I changed the order on our, on our team, but I wanted to uh, be able to introduce them in, in order uh, as they speak. Uh, first of all, Hilmi Panagoro, our wonderful 1984 alum, the president director of Medco Energy International. Uh, he has experience managing corporations based out of Indonesia, including Vico Indonesia. He's the active chair of multiple organizations, including the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, and he has many degrees and accolades, but the most important one for us, of course, is that he's a T-bird, true and true. And he has been such a generous and wonderful supporter, leader, and friend certainly since I have joined the school and we're just so grateful to have him. And so let me first come to you, Hilmi, and then I'll introduce the others in, in, in sequence. Uh, your reflections on what's happened uh, as a result of the pandemic, how has it impacted you know, the oil and gas sector, of course, the energy sector that you uh, have a company in your own company, you know, some initial reflections and, and to the extent that uh, uh, the ideas and, and the thoughts that Mark shared, uh, you know, sort of, uh, resonate with you, or you would like to complement them. So, Hilmi, welcome. Okay. Thank you, Sanjeev. Look, I think, first of all, for those who doesn't know Matco, I think uh, Matco's main business pillars are oil and gas, but we also have power generation and copper and gold mining. Well, let's we'll start with the bad news. COVID has basically impacted the demand for oil almost 30%. So at one point in time, the price dropped from 60 to zero. Even in the US, it's negative. I mean, people is willing to uh, pay for those who, who, who will store the oil somewhere. But it only happened for probably two weeks and then the price came back up. Now the price is $40, 43 for uh, Brent and 41 for WTI. Uh, the good news is, I think for a commodity player like us, the key strategy is 
to maintain the cost leadership. And, and, and we, are, we are very fortunate that we are able to maintain our cost level at, for oil today, average is $10 per barrel oil equivalent. So that's why when the oil price was dropped to 20, we are still okay. And many companies, they have to lay off uh, their employees. Thank God we don't have to lay off any of our employees. All of our 18,000 employees are still intact with the company. Uh, the other good news is, you know, our company is growing both organic and organically. And in the last three years, we have been acquiring three companies in Indonesia and about 4,000 new employees joining the organization. 1,000 of them is in Jakarta, in our headquarters office. So I do have concern on the number of people in our offices in Jakarta. It was about two years ago, I told my, my uh, head of uh, business share services, because I see a lot of my people, especially the engineers, they spend most of their time from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon in front of their computer. And they work based on a centralized database. So I told them, well, they can work from home. But their main concern is always the security of our infrastructure. How can they work from home, utilizing our, our, our intranet safely? And that has always been the concern from our IT people. And then COVID came and we were forced to work from home. Today, 90% of our people are working from home and all the operation is running, I would say, without any problem. So, uh, when the normal situation came back after COVID, hopefully soon, I don't think we will need to have our employees more than 50% than what it is today in the office. So that, that will further improve the, the, the way we work and, and the, the level of productivity. Uh, but again, to, to, to summarize, I think for, for a commodity player like us, the key is cost leadership. And, and that's what we are trying to maintain uh, now and in the future. That, that's probably an opening for me. We will, I'll be more than happy to discuss even further. Thank you. Wonderful, Hilmi. So wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing those initial insights. And we do know that cybersecurity has become even more important as we all have gone remote. Let me now welcome Hendra uh, Karta Sasmita, our distinguished alum of 1986. He has more than 35 years of experience in the consumer product companies, working with globally recognized corporations. He's presently serving on various advisory and oversight capacity as board of commissioner and advisor and a consultant for various companies. Uh, again, many great degrees, but the most important one from Thunderbird. <laughs> and uh, we want to welcome you, Hendra. And so some initial reflections from you, particularly looking from your vantage point of the uh, consumer co uh, product companies, uh, consumer facing companies in Indonesia, reflections in relation to uh, Mark's wonderful presentation. Welcome, my friend. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, thank you. Uh, my line is the consumer. So in consumers, actually, we starting point with uh, e-commerce. E-commerce is already there before even the, the pandemic. But the contributions to the total business is really small. 5%, 6% for Unilever. Uh, slightly bigger for L'Oreal. Uh, so the attention to, to the technology is not really great. But uh, with pandemic, it's not only the e-commerce, but actually even the normal consumer online is actually increasing. I will share with you actually my uh, two companies actually. The consumer industry actually they have a luxuries to be semi locked up, actually. Meaning, actually, during the lockdown period, actually, they can operate actually uh, uh, with uh, certain restrictions. So, with that, actually, one company, actually, a brand owner company, consumer product, actually, uh, having special projects, special product in supermarket because this supermarket is actually is part of the uh, sale, actually, big sale. The supermarket itself actually cannot sell because they don't have any, any online. But 
along the way, actually, supermarket working with the uh, freight hailing company, like Gojek, actually, to deliver the product. So that alone, the supply chain is increased. The company actually working very uh, good actually with uh, with the program in consumer in, in supermarket to have actually a special program with the cooking demo with uh, a lot of uh, activity related to supermarket to mini market actually, which resulted in increase of top line by ten percent in primary and fifteen percent in secondary. If you somebody who are not very familiar with this, secondary meaning selling to the outlet and primary selling to the distributor outlet. And then if you zoom in, actually 50% actually coming from modern market. So that's actually just to show actually the technology actually impact actually to the company who are really pay attention actually to the to the issue actually. The second one, actually, on the supply chains, actually, one of the distributor company, actually, uh, again, actually, during before the pandemic, actually, is just okay. The the idea here actually is very difficult, Mark, actually, in the reality, actually, to push actually the technology. Why? Because actually, it's not small amount of cutbacks. Actually, sometimes actually the shareholders do not want to invest or the CEO do not want to invest because of the bonus, but the smart actually uh, a company can play between the two and hires actually the advisor or the consultants actually, not really from MDB, um, they can see Boston for free, but we can have actually a consultant from uh, specialist consultants like uh, from Kearney, who really help actually the company designs actually the, the technology and it's not only design the technology but actually go to the long term actually on how to strategize actually the the business so with that actually we can negotiate actually how to deal with the consultant by at the same time actually having a cost reduction actually uh, so probably 30 percent of the fee actually as a sunk cost and the 70% actually variable depend on the cost saving or the uh, revenue we get actually. With that, we'll be minimize actually the, the impact of uh, investment. So with these actually, there are some company who are really if utilizing the technology can improve actually the, the either top line or bottom line company. But the one who are really struggling how to invest in the technology then actually is left behind because actually within the consumer product itself is quite a few company is still in the red especially from the cash flow perspective that probably my first uh, 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 observation is over thank you so much hendra fantastic let's go now to somia okay, the next slide so Somia Sivadas is our uh, Herbal alum from 2014, managing partner of FVG uh, Capital. It, she has experience consulting across multiple fields uh, spanning different countries, including management consulting, angel oh, investments, oh, operations, and high growth startups. Uh, again, uh, you know, when she was at uh, Thunderbird, she won virtually all the awards and most important uh, of her education is her wonderful Thunderbird degree. Somia has been doing fantastic work uh, in Jakarta and Indonesia, and we'd love to hear from you, Somia, in your perspective, particularly thinking about the startup community, entrepreneurs, what's happening uh, in those sectors, but more generally as well. Welcome, Somia. It's great to have you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, well, you know, Southeast Asia, almost 60 to 70 percent of, uh, of uh, private industries are actually small businesses. So the impact of pandemic on these small businesses as well as on startups is something which is probably much more pronounced than the larger companies, I would say. So I work on two fronts. I work with startups. I consult with them. And at the same time, I am also an angel investor. So if we were to look at just the startup community, you know, any founder that you ask um, prior to COVID period, they would say, if you ask them, what, what's your goal going to be? They would say growth, growth, and growth. But today that has changed. 
Um, it is more about survival, it's more about sustenance, it's more about cost cutting. So what we notice in the, among the startups is that the cash is draining very fast. It is not the right environment to actually raise money as well. And considering the market conditions, there will be significant amount of compression on their valuation as well. And um, so they also have to look at cost cutting measures. So we are hearing news of uh, massive layoffs, uh, even among the largest and largest of the startup communities here, startup, uh, startups here or the unicorns per se as well, um, have not been able to retain all of their employees. We are also seeing, as uh, Dr. Mark already mentioned, a lot of uh, localization also coming in. And that is particularly in India with some of the companies that I've invested in as well, where they are moving the supply chain back. So um, these are some of the changes that we are noticing in the startup. So the, the good news is actually that there is emergence of um, new types of companies or new startups, especially in the health tech sector, ed tech sector, um, and also e-commerce is doing pretty good. But there are also companies that have suffered mm, the fashion, beauty um, and retail sectors. The restaurants are also suffering. But we are, uh, you know, we are positive about startups. Startups is all about agility and their adaptability. And we are confident that the ones that can survive this phase will actually emerge as the winner. So Darwin theory is going to hold good. When it comes to the, the investment side, well, on a global level, um, we are seeing a, a significant reduction in the number of deals and that's true in Indonesia as well. Whatever deals that have come through or that we hear in the newspapers are also the deals that have happened actually in the year before. So um, from an early stage investment standpoint, that is where I come in as an angel investor, um, in the US almost 44% of decline has happened uh, when it comes to deals. And what we are noticing is that as companies progress, so for Series B, which is a larger size company, which is a more mature business, deals are still happening. So there is still positivity. The VCs and the angels are still positive about the fact that um, new businesses will come and that we are positive to help those businesses. But we are also sort of prudent that uh, for the current portfolio, they may need cash to actually survive this market, so uh, survive this pandemic. So we would want to reserve those money for our existing portfolios rather than invest in a new uh, company. So those are some of the broader aspects of what's happening among the startup community as well as on the, uh, on the investment fronts. Thank you, Dean. Thank you so much, Samia. So I want to welcome everyone to begin to introduce questions. We already have a few from Iswara, Thomas, and Rod, two in the Q&A function. Ideally, if you could put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, if you're on your laptop or your computer, uh, it allows us to see them and then, and, and then uh, make sure we don't lose them. In the chat, they can uh, go away <laughs> as other folks introduce uh, comments and reflections. Uh, before I go to the questions that, and I see that there's another one great uh, that's, uh, that are coming up, let me come back to you, Mark, and as you reflect on what you heard from our incredible Indonesian alums, their experience, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and alums in Indonesia, you know, how does that reflect on the flip it model, for example, specifically, but more generally, as you've been looking around the world at the impacts of the pandemic and the rise of new normals uh, in the plural you know, how do you integrate some of what you've heard? Great, thanks thank so much, Sanjib. Well, I think, you know, uh, a country like Indonesia has always uh, been faster at validating ideas from the market uh, back into the value chain. In, in other parts of the world, we tend to spend more time in, in defining the process before we get into the market and then we waiting for the market to validate. Uh, I think Indonesia has historically in the last few years, and, and it did not change during our, our the pandemic. He has created the opportunity at the market level and then reverse engineered this back into the value chain. So that is something that I think in, 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 in um, uh, ideal terms, we could also learn to transfer as, as a learning throughout this pandemic. Um, I was particularly uh, struck when uh, the idea of the uh, localized production on one side and also the drop of demand of oil on the other one were mentioned by our guest because it really proved one of the conversations we're having about decentralized supply chains. And I think, you know, since you won the area where more and more need, uh, study needs to be done uh, is really what will supply chain look like? Oh. 
equally have an impact. So these are some of the unique action I have. Um, but I, I admire, I remember from my time in Indonesia, I admire the ability of this country to really uh, be very much driven by, uh, by action. And this is really where, where we should really Sorry, Sanjeev, I think, I think you lost me for a second. Is that yes, right? uh, you're back now, Mark, you're back. Yeah, yeah, sorry, just, okay. So i um, not sure whether you heard, but what I'm trying to say is, is I really appreciate the, the more uh, applied way of uh, validating ideas in the market that Indonesia has demonstrated. In other parts of the world, we should learn to do the same and become a little bit less sometimes uh, tied up by the process and much more inspired by the le lesson from the market. Great, thank you so much. We have a great question. I'm gonna to go to, to you, Hendra, from Tom, Thomas, uh, who asks, do you think e-commerce companies are gonna accept cryptocurrency uh, as a payment method? Uh, may help with exchange rates, may help with other uh, liquidity issues. So what's your sense? Has uh, the pandemic accelerated uh, the use of cryptocurrency uh, generally, but particularly for e-commerce companies? Hendra? Uh, you're muted, just to, just Go off mute, my friend. Cryptocurrency is the future, future, future for Indonesia. So uh, right now it is still shifting exactly from the money to uh, what you call it, uh, go pay or whatever you call it actually. That is still in the transitions actually. Uh, to answer your question, so that will be the next thing because if you see actually the, the e-commerce, India and China is far away from Indonesia. Indonesia is a starting point. As I said earlier, actually Indonesia is well behind because of the contributions to the total actually uh, uh, portfolio is still very low. In Unilever it's only less than 5%. In rapid debt is probably less than 10%. Uh, L'Oreal is slightly big. So, the, in, the attention to that actually is still far away. Hopefully, answer the questions. Absolutely, thank you so much. Hilmi, if I can come to you, Iswar is asking, which, you know, there's this, this um, of course, this creative tension or trade-off, maybe more than a creative, very, you know, fundamental tension of reopening business, reopening the economy, and obviously public health, making sure that everyone's healthy and safe re with respect to the pandemic. Uh, in terms of Medco, but you know, and your leadership role in more generally with industry in Indonesia, how are uh, your colleagues, your peers, CEOs, and more generally leadership in Indonesia looking at this trade-off between reopening the economy uh, and the lockdown to ensure you know, public health and safety? Well, first of all, for our company, the health, and the safety of our employees is, is not a trade-off. They are the main priority. So that they, I have to make sure whatever we do, their safety and health is number one priority. But thank God, within our group, uh, there were two identified by rapid test, by the way, as positive, but after two weeks of isolation, they were all uh, recovered. So, in, in our company, it's basically zero COVID at the moment. Uh, in Jakarta and East Java, unfortunately, the, the number is still rising, and also for Indonesia. But I think for Indonesia, we need to balance between uh, economic recovery and, 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 and health. So I think the government is now trying to compromise by basically started to open the economy uh, gradually. So the, the, the health protocol will continue to be applied uh, at maximum uh, level, but at the same time, we started to open the economy. Today, uh, unfortunately, the result is not very good. Uh, after the government reopened the, 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 the economy, the mall started to open, although uh, 
movie theater and, and, and bars, they are not open yet. But we see the, the trend of the uh, positive cases rising. So I don't know where the balance is, but I think the government is trying very hard today to, to, to balance this opening up of the economy, but at the same time, maintain the health protocol at, at the maximum level. We are, we are successful at the company level, but at the country level, it's, it's, it's more difficult. We empathize and we just want to put in the chat, thank you, uh, Hilmi, for your incredible Tiver leadership and how you're leading your company with your brother and family. Uh, it just goes to show uh, the values that we all believe and hold that, yes, health and safety has to be paramount uh, during this time while we continue to take care of our uh, businesses, our companies, our organizations, our communities. So, yeah, I want to come back to you and ask you, uh, you know, you started to talk a little bit about the startup community and what's happening in startups and so forth. You know, are there unexpected areas where you're seeing new startups or the potential for new startups? Where might be new areas of growth and innovation? Uh, you know, we're early days, of course, it's three, four, five months into the to the pandemic, but are you starting to see either, you know, just a little bit of traces of new things that are happening or areas where investors are looking particularly? I would love to hear, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So actually Sanjeev, the time is more towards whether they can survive. So what we are seeing is more of pivot uh, from their current business models to something which is remotely closer to them that can help them and sustain. Um, when it comes to emergence of uh, new startups, of course, we are seeing in the ed tech as well as in the health tech, uh, there are startups that are coming in and also on the AI side as well. So as you may know, we uh, Indonesia in general has a large number of uh, uh, employees on the call center aspect as well. And now startups are actually looking at uh, AI chatbots more to reduce their operational costs. So technology-based companies, cloud software, SaaS, those are the uh, industries and also mobile gaming and media that they are not affected at all. In fact, they are all on the positive side. So we are seeing trends more towards uh, startups coming in those mushrooming in those uh, areas. Now, what we have to understand is that um, if the funding does not come in, a lot of them will not be able to survive this period without actually having a very cost efficient model. So the current focus among most of the startups is actually to look at their operational costs and to sort of control that and may pivot if nothing else works. So the way they're doing it is, on the first step, they look at whether a reduction of um, overhead costs can happen. Um, they look at reducing the salaries of the employees. And if that does not happen, the third thing that they do is try to pivot. And there are lots of examples that we see in the market right now with um, um, even in Singapore as well, one of the companies that was into sports, so which was in Dr. Mark's presentation on the red side, uh, they they were in the business of actually helping people to book uh, time slots for sports activities. And now you can't do that with a lockdown. So the, the, the closest model that they could pivot into was to actually having these virtual classes where a trainer can come in and you can subscribe for it. So what we are seeing more of is businesses trying to pivot in order to actually survive more than emergence of um, you know, new companies. It's a great point. And it's a great point. We see this all over the world. We have a question for you, uh, Mark, from uh, one of our fantastic Indonesian students, uh, uh, um, and uh, Dow Joseph. He says, I agree with the phenomenon that you described, highlighting that uh, the automation and more virtual methods that we're gonna experience in coming days. I think industries that produce hardware that is used to conduct automation and virtual business is the most pr uh, prospective sector among all rising potentials. What do you think about that? Right, so Sanjay, this is uh, uh, from, so I can call the name, which is, uh, oh, here in the chat, right? In the chat. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the chat, actually, now, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, Dao, thanks so much for your question. Um, so, I think the um, the sector that has, so in, in the physical world, in the automation, the factor that has to do and deal with physical production, so manufacturing, um, so there's a lot of countries where manufacturing is still quite important. I mean. Uh, China is an epicenter, but Southeast Asia in general is the home of uh, a significant portion of the manufacturing in the world. Um, those are areas where manufacturing will continue. Uh, they will continue probably at a decreased volume, but they will try to probably offset the loss of volume with the saving on cost. 
So I would say this is probably where I would say there is a significant um, space and room for, uh, for automation to really happen. There's also automation in services, which is important though, to consider. Um, many services, they started to get more into what we call intelligent automation, some form of automation that tried to replace, unfortunately, some of the basic jobs that were attached to this. Um, we always mistake uh, job for task. Unfortunately, we tend to replace jobs when well, what intelligent automation should do is to enhance or replace the task with uh, the integration within uh, the labor force. Um, that said, I think a lot of areas, specifically in what we call the uh, services and the white collar areas, will uh, see a rise in, in intelligent automation, which is a step before artificial intelligence is where you are transforming digitally your operations. I would say that these are the two areas of reflection where I can just add as food for thought. Sanjeev, back to you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, 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 Hendra, we have a question uh, for you and, and Pakilmi from Andy uh, asking, anticipating new normal where technology will be applied in most business processes, could you predict or estimate or do you see how much employees will be reduced? Uh, we already see that, uh, of course, because of the pandemic, unemployment around the world has risen. We, we, we have been predicting about a doubling of unemployment long term as a result of the pandemic. What are you seeing in Indonesia? Uh, building on the incredible, you know, sort of case though that Helmi shared of his own company where they've been able to uh, not let go anyone, at least until the time being. Andrew, what's the future on employment, unemployment because of uh, the pandemic and then, of course, the acceleration of various uh, transformations that have occurred because of it? Um, okay, okay, fine. Uh, it depends on the, on the company to the company. For the company who are really managed, like I said earlier, the technology is no problem, not even the layoff. But within the company, they have a business unit, say the retailing Gojek and Grab. It's very good. The Gojek and Grab actually lay off about 450, uh, uh, 350 people, actually. But that's actually the, the, the the segment or the business unit, which is have very high interaction. So we have to lay off that actually. But the one which is actually a, a business, which is uh, healthy and the Gojek right now, instead of actually taking the passengers, actually taking actually the, the product from supermarket to the house. So that's extra basically for them to, to uh, what you call it, to get the income. In general, in the consumer, up to the June, actually, as I said earlier, actually, uh, a few data is still going very good, actually. Uh, June onward, there will be a problem probably in the cash flow because of, it's not only the company itself, they have suppliers, they have uh, uh, other trade or whatever. So we are right now, some of the uh, uh, company see <coughs> what is the upside, what is the downside, actually, to see. Because and they already protect, actually, what is how to accrue or whatever of the uncollected, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, money. But in general, so far, it's still not really mass layoff in the parts of the product industry. Thank you, over to you. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, Hilmi, um, uh, we have a question uh, from um, uh, Marcel that I think you know, you've been handling, obviously, with Medco. During this pandemic, where the market is really unpredictable, we have to prioritize health and safety, which is costly as well. And on the other hand, we have to maintain our cash flow, uh, cash preservation. How do we balance all these issues? How have you balanced those issues of, of the short-term cash flow, uh, obviously continuing to pivot to the new companies that you've acquired while also maintaining health and, and prioritizing health and safety? Well, cash is king. <laughs> and as I said, one of the key uh, thing that makes us survive is our cost leadership in oil, in gas, also in, in our mining operations. We are probably one of the best today. So that's why when, when the oil price drop or gas price drop or even copper price drop, other people has to close down their operation, we are still uh, in, a, in a good situation. And that's the reason why we don't, ha we don't have to lay off anybody at the moment. The only thing that has changed is the way we work. I mean, as I told you, 
uh, when when this thing back to normal, I think I predicted not more than 50% of our employees need to work in the office. But the rest will be working from home. But the challenge is, of course, when people are start to work from home, there are things that they will miss. For instance, the interaction between the senior engineer and the junior engineer, how the mentoring process is done. I mean, this is the way, the new way we are doing things. So we have to, we have to learn how to adapt with this new situation. Thank you so much. We're going to go, we're, uh, there are many great questions and with all of our global dialogues, we unfortunately can't get to all of them. So my apologies. We're going to go to last reflections, comments from everyone. I'm going to start with you, Somia. Any final reflections, ideas, thoughts you want to reflect on, share with our incredible um, alums and partners around the world, students, Somia. Well, uh, I think to just summarize, the spirit is tough for everybody, be it a small company, a startup, or a large company, and it is a matter of resilience and also on how uh, the principles on which our businesses have been built. So uh, during the tough times, I think um, usually tough times bring out the best. You see the largest emergence of companies when uh, largest innovations also happening during tough times. So I'm pretty positive that once we get through this phase and hopefully uh, the vaccine comes out as well, we'll all get through this and we'll probably see a wave of new companies coming in uh, that will revolutionize the way we work, revolutionize the way we actually live. So that's, that's my final thought. Thank you so much. Uh, Pak Hendra, maybe we can come to you for your final reflections. And there were a set of questions that are around, you know, how has Indonesia really responded to this? What's the future of Indonesia? So anything you might reflect on that, given your incredible experience, all your knowledge. Uh, but any final thoughts, my friend? My final thoughts, actually, my final thoughts, actually, we see actually a few articles from different consultants, actually, the need of technology. Right, the need of technology. And now actually we realize this is very significantly actually make a difference between the one who are with technology and without technology. The question is actually how to fundraise actually to get the technology, you need the art actually. and you need a leadership basically to really maneuver actually how to get this. I mean, probably you don't get the full amount of money, but like I said earlier, probably if you really combine how to get the fundraising and to combine with the cost reductions, that probably is the way it is actually with the sum cost. We can talk more details in whatever the event, uh, uh, the next event, but that's probably the way it is. Otherwise, you'll be stuck. So that's probably why my, uh, what you call it, observations actually in this guy. Final. Over to you. Thank you so much, Henry. I'm going to go back to you, Hilmi. There was a question, and as you think about your final reflection, will will the Indonesian government uh, reconsider nuclear energy? This is a hot topic, not only in Indonesia but around the world. But mm -hmm. uh, you could address that or not, uh, but or more generally, just your your final reflections on the new normal and post post -pan the post pandemic uh, dynamics. Uh, Hilmi. Well, nuclear energy is probably still far from Indonesia. I mean, I mean, even our company in the past, we have done the a joint study with the government, and the conclusion is probably not in the near future. We still have other sources, including renewables, which is now developing uh, very rapidly in the country. So in this energy transition, I think nuclear is still probably low priority for this country. Any other final reflections, my dear friend? Just want to thank you again. and. Uh, Hendra and Somi, I'm going to go over to, to Mark in a second. Anything else you want to share? Okay. The, Mark, uh, final reflection. There was a set of questions about, you know, sort of the changing global order and with the decline of the U.S. or the seeming decline of the U.S., you know, what are the, the new uh, global leaders? Obviously, we, yesterday we had a global dialogue, dear friends, on China and India uh, with another one of our fantastic new faculty members, Professor Doug Guthrie. Uh, you can get a, a video of that or a link to that on uh, Tiber Connect or on our website. But Mark, any final reflections and particularly anything you want to share about, you know, the changing global order beyond business particularly and, you know, the U.S., China, India, Indonesia, uh, Mark. 
Thanks so much, Sanjeev. So first, uh, maybe a reflection is clearly many of the organizations or entity that have suffered through the pandemic, they were already quite, uh, uh, quite sick before the pandemic. It's just that they were continuing to run in because um, the system was somehow providing them with some oxygen. But once the system became more, uh, more troubling, of course, the company that have the least resilient structure, they were the one that suffered the most. So a reflection on how we will build the, the, the organization of tomorrow is really more about understanding that shocks and systemic shock will continue to come our way. Rather than thinking there are externalities, they will have to become part of our new understanding of reality. And I think we can ma make that sh mental shift happen. Uh, also, the global order, Sanjeev, I think even before the pandemic, we could see that uh, the, the world order design after World War II was uh, coming to some form of uh, end, if not transformation or catalyst towards something else. The rise of China and I think the epicenter on Asia is now clear and evident. Uh, I think the Asian economy are much more technocrat than the West. And I think technocracy in this, in this immediate next month will be important to navigate uh, the next few steps. And I really think that the world has understood that uh, Asia now is not only, it's not only soft power, it's also hard power. And I think it's, it's, it's a new reality to deal with. And how will we reconsider and recalibrate the role for the West? I think it's an important kind of conversation to have. That's why I think what well, this nice at Thunderbird is that we think of ourselves as an American uh, university for the world, not just for the US. And I think this is clear also under your leadership. So these are my, my final reflections. Well, thank you very much. In fact, I take it one step farther. We think of us ourselves as a global institution that happens to be located in the United States. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so I wanna thank our incredible panelists, uh, Hilmi, Hendra, Somia, Mark, uh, all of our great alums and partners, students, faculty, uh, staff, who have joined us from around the world. As you can see, we have also uh, advanced and accelerated and amplified our digital transformation at Thunderbird. As I said in the beginning, uh, despite the incredible challenges, not only are we surviving, but we are thriving, largely due to the incredible support of, our, of alumni, uh, such as our distinguished panelists, uh, whether through helping us find fantastic students or help them with mentoring or uh, internships or employment. Uh, we also have our pub campaign, so for those of you who know, we have our brand new building and on the fifth floor, we're gonna have a spectacular new pub. So if you wanna contribute to that, that is the, the T-Bird heart and soul. Uh, and we have these fantastic digital asynchronous portfolio as well as uh, synchronous online portfolio of exec ed programs that we've offered to our alums and partners, obviously at discounted prices because we're part of the same community. So if we can be helpful in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out. Let's remember our three cardinal principles that I think Hilmi so adequately uh, reinforced with the, his leadership of Medco. Health and safety is first, excellence is second, and third is bringing the world together uh, and ensuring that we are working together collaboratively in a true T-Bird way, borderless in these very difficult times. Please stay safe and healthy, everyone. God bless. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you. <laughs>